Hello and good morning everyone and thank you for joining our Symantec Endpoint Protection 14 webinar today. Uh, so we are joined here by Jake Wardell from Symantec who will be going through the webinar with you. And then we also have uh, Matt Compton here from Bytes who will be discussing the relationship between Bytes and Symantec briefly. Thanks Amy. Um, so just a quick intro uh, for myself, so I look after the semantic business of Bytes, so Bytes and Symantec have a, a long-standing relationship, well over 15 years, closer to 20 now that um, we've worked in partnership and that's because we see them as absolute best of breed technology within the market. Um, obviously there's been some changes recently uh, in terms of the split from Veritas and more recently uh, the Bluka acquisition. Um, absolutely we feel that they're a dedicated security platform that is uh, market leading and some of the roadmap and futures that we're seeing are very, very exciting. Um, now they are purely a, a focused security house. Um, <clears throat> Set 14 is a, is a very recent release and at Bytes we'd like to get um, publicize these into the market and get our customers up to speed to understand the new and exciting tech that they've put into these products. So um, I'll hand over to Jake who's going to go into to details as to um, what's new with um, Set 14 um, and what's different from the past and then we'll come back with a bit of a QA and a at the end um, and I'll be online with uh, Jake to, to answer any questions that you may have and as Amy says if, if you get them throughout the webinar there's a there's a box on the right hand side so just type them in there and then we'll follow up at the end. Thank you. Excellent, thanks for that Matt. Good morning everybody, my name is Jake Waddell, I'm a, an information security consultant here at Symantec. Um, I've got a specialism uh, around a number of our product areas with, with Symantec Endpoint Protection being one of them. Uh, so what I'm really going to do this morning is run through a bit of a deep dive into the, the technical functionality of Symantec Endpoint Protection 14, uh, the detection technologies that we've brought to bear uh, in the new piece, uh, as well as covering obviously what the, the sort of traditional stack looks like that we've brought over from SET12, uh, along with the enhancements that, that 14 has brought with it as well. So what I want to do uh, is really run through, firstly, why we need to advance why do we need to evolve endpoint protection? Obviously everybody years back would have had traditional AV, everything would have been signature based and that would have all been great. But when we start looking at the number of bits of malware that we're seeing, uh, so in 2015 we saw 430 million new variants of malware. So when we start seeing that kind of figure, signature based detection is, is clearly dead. Uh, but equally, uh, we need to be moved beyond even sort of normal behavioral heuristics uh, as well as other types of technology, uh, and we really need to bring a full stack to bear to be able to say, yep, we've managed to get the protection levels deep enough that we will discover those, those new variants of malware before uh, a vendor has even seen them. So typically we'll be dealing with uh, day dot kind of malware, where we may be the first person to see it, but we need to be able to block that anyway. When we start looking at the, the number of zero-day vulnerabilities as well, there's a, a huge increase in these being discovered. So again, we need to be able to look at how we protect the applications themselves from, from malicious code. Uh, and, and I'm sure most of you guys on the, the webinar will be aware, but the, the huge increase in ransomware. Every single customer that I've spoken to recently has had either an outbreak or an attempted outbreak uh, of ransomware that they've then had to subsequently deal with. Uh, and the, the sort of cost of remediation for ransomware can be huge. Not necessarily from the, the pain and the fine point, but actually then going out, uh, remediating, re-imaging machines, uh, and doing all of the other bits that uh, essentially are required to get the estate back up to a working uh, standard to ensure that productivity can continue. So what we need to understand really is the, the sort of what we'll call the attack chain. How does the attack progress? Uh, so we can look at how different bits of our stack can match the different areas of the attack chain. So really we can provide that defense in depth model through a single agent. So typically malware will have an incursion stage at the start, uh, the most common route still being email, but web type uh, traffic from drive by downloads or, or watering hole attacks. We're also seeing applications delivering it, uh, as well as people plugging in devices uh, that contain malware. So common one, somebody sticks in a USB stick, they've been using it at home, home machines riddled with malware, all of a sudden the USB stick is, bring it into the enterprise, 
uh, and then we've got an outbreak from that point. We then look at the infection. So what is the route to infection? Is it coming from a file? Is it coming from a macro? Is it coming from crypto type stuff? Or is it coming from a rootkit? Uh, and this is really the point where we need to try and prevent a lot of the stuff. So the infection stage is the really key stage for us to bring our, our prevention technologies. We then have infestation. So as the, the malware uh, migrates across the enterprise and, and propagates, we need to look at how it's then moving across. What's it trying to do? Is it trying to exfiltrate data? Uh, is it using command and control servers to pull down additional malware? Uh, and we need to be able to look at what behavior is happening at the infestation stage and again limit the spread uh, and limit the damage caused by that. And then we have the inoculation stage. So being able to quarantine files uh, and endpoints uh, and remove uh, and then essentially fix and remediate uh, any malware that did get through. So as we look through set 14, we'll start seeing uh, prevention across the first three stages and then endpoint detection uh, and remediation uh, for the inoculation stage. So really we need to just understand that because of the multiple vectors and the diverse payloads, we really need a comprehensive single product that can do the full stack. So this is just one quick little quote from Verizon from their data breach investigations report. But essentially, malicious software was involved in 90% of cyber espionage incidents in the year. So what we're seeing is malware is the, the precursor to a data breach, essentially. Somebody will come into the enterprise, they will infect the systems, they will then give themselves access, and using that access and leveraging that, then they can start exfiltrating data, which they'll typically do in an encrypted fashion to make it very difficult to see at that point. So the earlier in the attack stage that we can find that, the better. So that's where Spantic Endpoint Protection 14 comes in. So it is a multi-layer protection uh, engine powered by artificial intelligence and machine learning. The, the key three messages are we're going to offer superior protection over competitors and over our previous release of SAT-12. We're going to perform high performance. So we're going to ensure that the agent is streamlined and it is, it's non-impactful on the enterprise. I know that's a typical bugbear of, of IT departments uh, and of users that the endpoint antivirus or endpoint protection technology slows users down uh, or impacts them in a, in a negative way. So we have a number of technology pieces in here that, that will counter that. Uh, and, and especially over when we start looking at SEC 12, there are huge advancements in, in how small our definition files are, uh, along with the uh, overall performance tuning of the console and agent itself. Uh, and then we need to do orchestrated response. So let's be realistic. There may be uh, a piece of malware that will evade the typical prevention stack. So we need to automate and orchestrate the, the remediation and removal of that malware afterwards uh, to ensure that the, the damage is limited to one machine uh, and that we can then automatically remove it uh, after quarantining that machine off the network. So let's delve into the protection side of things first because this is really where uh, a lot of the key concerns are. We want to ensure that we're catching as much of the bad stuff up front uh, as possible. So being able to provide next-gen technologies as well as the baseline and essential technologies uh, is really key. So some of the stuff we'll talk about is, is new type features that we've brought into the product. That's not to say that the signature piece has been removed. That still captures about 20% of the malware that we see. But we do need to obviously move beyond that and start looking at next-gen type technologies as well. So when we look at the protection stack and how it sort of fits across the entire stack, uh, attack stage, we've got the incursion, infection, infiltration stages. So if we start with incursion, we have a, uh, a firewall and intrusion prevention uh, at an endpoint level. So we can put an endpoint firewall in uh, with a set of default rules that again can be added to and customized to ensure that we're limiting what traffic can reach an endpoint. Worth bearing in mind when we say an endpoint in the semantic world, this will fit across both a, an endpoint and a server estate. So it may be more relevant to the servers to start putting in uh, the firewall features and functionality uh, and being able to tweak that to ensure that only uh, the required traffic is flowing in and out of that device type. We also have host-based intrusion prevention. So there's a number of pre-built signatures in there that will look for known attack patterns and stop them before they even hit the operating system. So the aim being to minimize the risk before we've even let that network traffic onto the machine. 
We then introduced application and device control. So being able to restrict what applications run on the machine, being able to do application whitelisting and blacklisting, uh, as well as doing device whitelisting and blacklisting. So for example, if we realize that USB sticks are a threat to the organization, we can limit them uh, and we can say, nope, we don't want any USB sticks. Or we can be more granular and say, we don't want any USB sticks except for these 10 that we know IT use uh, for their day-to-day -day work. And we can define those by serial number and allow those to be used uh, as they would be. Um, but again, restrict any other unauthorized device from being plugged into the machine. We then move into memory exploit mitigation. So looking at zero day exploits in, in popular software. So at the moment, we have a uh, supported list of 20 of the most common bits of software that you'll find in, in an organization. Uh, and we have uh, essentially hardening and, and monitoring rules that sit around those to ensure that we are uh, not allowing them to write things to memory or do other exploits that could be triggered against them um, that would uh, in turn compromise the system. We then have reputation analysis. So this, this point is really important for, for Symantec. Symantec overall has 175 million endpoints uh, protected under the Symantec Endpoint Protection product. And essentially, a lot of those are feeding back telemetry to Symantec. So we have the largest intelligence network of threats in the public space. Uh, there are only two people with a bigger one, and they're both three-letter acronyms out of the US. Um, but essentially, we have a, a huge raft of data uh, around what kind of threats and what kind of files exist in the wild. So a good example would be, if we saw a, an executable file on a machine, we would have a reputation for that. Uh, and a reputation is built up of the file's age, how prevalent it is. So if there's more than maybe 100 copies of it in the world, it's probably slightly more reputable than if there were two. Uh, has it been digitally signed by a known uh, software manufacturer? And how is it being used, essentially? So using all of that, we can build a reputation score for a file. If we think about how rapidly sort of mutating malware works and, and polymorphic malware, that will change how it looks at a code level uh, after it infects maybe two machines. So we're going to start seeing very low reputations for that kind of, kind of malware. So we can decide, based on a, a definable threshold in the product, do we want to stop suspicious looking files? Uh, and that's where reputation analysis fits in. We then have our advanced machine learning. So being able to do pre-execution uh, of threats, essentially, to monitor whether or not they look suspicious. And um, we'll delve into that in a little bit more detail as we go through. We also have an emulator to be able to unpack malware. So malware will now quite often pack itself um, into a uh, obfuscated package. Using that method, it will typically bypass standard detection technologies. So we can actually unpack that using the emulator and then scan it against the rest of the protection stack. We then have our traditional AV engine, so using uh, sort of standard behavioral uh, stuff as well as signature stuff, uh, and they're the two next boxes. Uh, and then coming back to the infestation and exfiltration stage, we start where, or we end where we started. So we still have the firewall in there, and we have the IPS in there, so we can actually monitor to see if somebody is trying to exfiltrate data back to a known command and control server. So using the IPS signatures, we can understand yeah, this is typically an exfiltration pattern. Let's stop that from happening at the network layer, uh, and let's shut that transaction down. So drilling into a couple of those, and these are the predominantly new technologies uh, in set 14 over set 12. Uh, and this is what we'll define as our being sort of next gen technology. Uh, and this is where we've had to evolve the product to, to ensure that we capture the next X percentage of malware. Um, so the first piece is advanced machine learning. So being able to look for unknown threats in that mutating malware again, by essentially collecting malware and collecting files on a machine and putting it back through a training algorithm. So in a typical machine learning fashion, we will grab sample files from a, a machine or a, or a laptop, whatever it might be, or a server. We'll feed those through the training algorithm. We know which ones are bad because we've seen their, their actions. And using that, we can then very quickly train the system to know what that malware looks like. And that can happen either on the client or in the cloud. So we have, obviously, our large intelligence network that helps feed this information. And we use our traditional detection technologies as well as a wraparound to this 
but this is where we really go out and we learn what bad stuff looks like and we use that to protect the machine itself. The, the sort of efficiency that comes through that is very high and when we look at the performance side of it, the actual updates that are required for that are, are very minimal. So because we're doing a lot of that machine learning on the, the machine itself instead of in the cloud, we can actually keep the, the definition size low and the, the patterns low that we need to learn against. I've already touched on this, uh, and this is what sort of drives a lot of that, but it's the, the Global Threat Intelligence Network. So I'm not going to go through all the statistics on here, but we've seen a lot of these bits already. So the 430 million unique pieces of malware, we actually scan a third of the world's email traffic every day. Because of the, the wide variety of products and, and areas that Svantec play in, we actually get a lot of this threat data through other vectors other than just the endpoint as well. So we see a lot of web traffic, especially now through the Blue Cat acquisition. We've already integrated their intelligence network into ours. So their intelligence on, on web feeds that they've gathered through the proxy in their cloud service over time, we now have that visibility as well. We also have our email visibility, uh, as well as visibility from our own cloud services. So we have a huge amount of telemetry in there that we can use to make educated decisions against uh, when we start looking at what is suspicious and what isn't suspicious. So the next piece of core technology is memory exploit mitigation. So if we think about how a zero day attack works, essentially the bad guy will find a vulnerability, it will get disclosed, then the patch will get released and then the patch gets applied. So if we look at how long that takes, it can be a huge cycle before that patch gets uh, applied to the right systems. So we end up uh, with a very long window of uh, uh, vulnerability. And um, we'll call it the zone of exploitation in this case. But what the memory exploit mitigation piece will do is allow us to preemptively block uh, typical exploit techniques against a set of uh, files that we already know. So a set of applications that we already know, we've managed to put together um, a list of known exploit techniques that we used against them, so we can start looking at how we would go about doing that. And that works in a completely signatureless manner, um, so we can start looking at whatever type of flaw or vulnerability we find in the application, we're essentially running that application in a, in a hardened state so that the exploits cannot be run against it. So we remove that zone of exploitation by essentially protecting from day dot or actually day minus one before the attack can ever be even conceived. So emulation capability. We've already talked about being able to unpack malware. Um, the malware will arrive, it will be in an executable file, it will be then packaged within that executable. Essentially what we're going to do is run a lightweight virtual environment, unpack that, look at what the payload looks like, scan the payload through the traditional stack, uh, through the rest of the, the next gen stack as well, uh, and to establish whether or not that's malicious. So essentially all we're doing is unpacking in a virtual uh, environment uh, and then scanning the payload uh, and the actual contents of the executable fully to ensure that we capture everything that might be going through there. We talked about file reputation analysis at a high level, but essentially we're using that age, frequency uh, and that location to work out whether or not a file is good. Uh, and as I said before, we can actually set thresholds for this. So the typical use case that I use for that, and, and no offense to any salespeople that are on the call, salespeople will typically go out to the internet uh, and download whatever they want. They're, they're not as risk savvy, they're not as aware of what the problem might be uh, with downloading a file from a website. Uh, so what we need to do is potentially put their threshold higher to detect more of the stuff and be a little bit more suspicious about what they are downloading. Whereas IT might go out and they might download a patch or a DLL uh, and that might actually only have about five copies of it in the world. There might be a very short um, sort of lifespan on that. It might not be signed. So actually we need to start looking at yes, IT will download stuff that, that has a, a more suspicious rating, so we can adjust the threshold accordingly for different departments based on group membership within the console. Uh, so that really allows us to be quite flexible about how we work. We have behavioral monitoring. So we're going to start looking at how an application runs or how a file executes at the time of running. So let's use the PDF example. I open a PDF, what should it do? It should launch Adobe Acrobat and it should display the contents of that PDF on the screen. 
it shouldn't then go right into the host file. It shouldn't go writing things into the registry, or it shouldn't go deleting Windows files or modifying them. So that kind of behavior uh, and the attack chains that we know of uh, feed this. So we have 1,400 uh, file behaviors to look for. So what's it doing? Where's it come from? Who is it related to? So this bit's key. Malware will traditionally spawn additional malware. So we need to start looking at what is the parent file for this file? Has this been generated by something that we've previously convicted? If so, we need to shut it down uh, and we need to block it at this point. We also have a uh, very sort of advanced uh, AI classification for this as well. So instead of us having to manually author these defection chains uh, and, and known attack vectors, we can actually just use the AI-based stuff using, again, the gin to actually put that together uh, and understand what a traditional attack will look like. Uh, and using that, we can create automatic signatures for this. So that's the protection stance. So we've obviously looked at the, the full raft uh, of what we're going to use to detect against malware. But what we really need to understand is how that works and how that performs. Obviously, that's a, a very large looking stack. So what we need to be able to do is understand how it's managed uh, and how that actually works from an endpoint perspective. So essentially, we have a single management console and we have a single agent approach. And it's a single lightweight agent that will sit out It'll pull down minimal definitions because it's now relying heavily on some of the, the more sort of advanced features that are less signature based. Uh, so we can actually then protect uh, that endpoint without impacting the user or impacting the business itself. One of the key things that we've now got, and this is a completely optional piece depending on deployment types and, and sort of what's available within the environment, but we will use what we'll call the intelligent threat cloud. So a, a user when they run an application, we can actually pull that straight up and, uh, and monitor what that file looks like against known signatures that we have in the cloud. So instead of having to pull definitions for every signature that we have, we can actually just look to the cloud and say, I'm running this file, here's its hash, is that malicious or not? Uh, and instead of then having to pull down huge amounts of data, we can do that in real time. Uh, so that leads to essentially a 70% reduction uh, in bandwidth for the definition file updates. So we start looking at how big defs are, uh, there's a huge reduction in their size. So this piece really sort of speaks to why we look at using a single agent. So I've spoken to a lot of companies recently that have gone, yeah, we've got an anti-malware technology, we're using McAfee on the endpoint, for example, but then we've gone and bought something next gen, so we're then running Silence alongside that, uh, and then we're running an EDR type technology, so an endpoint detection response. So we're running carbon black for that. Uh, and what that essentially leads to is three management consoles, three agents to maintain. Uh, and then you've also got to look at the interoperability of all three of those. Are they conflicting with each other? Is one of them being triggered by another one? Uh, and really that, that leads to a big sort of management headache. So as we saw at the start, we actually play across the entire stack. We have our traditional anti-malware piece. We have our, our next-gen technologies that, that compete in that silence type space where we're looking at advanced machine learning. We also have the exploit mitigation that sits against people like Palo Alto traps. And we also have our EDR capability, which we'll talk about in a second uh, when we get to the orchestration piece, that will allow us to do automated uh, detection and response using our, our on-prem or cloud sandbox uh, and then our orchestrated response via the SEP agent, uh, again, using the single piece. So, when we look at how we can actually do it, we can just bring the semantic endpoint protection agent out, use one agent for all four areas of that, uh, and in turn really reduce the cost of ownership, uh, as well as reduce the cost of management and the, the, the sort of overall headache that comes with managing multiple products. So let's talk about orchestrated response. We've touched on it there, uh, but let's work out how we then remediate. So if malware does get into a machine, or a machine does become compromised, how do we look at the inoculation phase? How do we stop uh, the malware propagating? How do we clean it off the machine and ensure that, that machine is then secure and ready to go back onto the network at the end of the day? So we have a number of technologies, uh, and a lot of these came through from SEP12, but Power Eraser is a very, very aggressive remediation tool. Uh, what it'll do is it'll essentially look for infections at the point of booting, so the machine will get rebooted, 
uh, and as soon as it starts to load the operating system, we'll start tying in at that point and looking for where the malware is residing. Uh, and at that point, we can rip it out. We have host integrity. So actually, this really speaks to being able to do uh, compliance and ensuring that our machines are up to date. So let's use the use case of a uh, guy takes laptop out into the field, doesn't come back into the office for four weeks. He hasn't connected his laptop to the internet in that time. Essentially, the risk at this point is that his definitions are out of date, his AV is out of date, and everything else. So what we can do using host integrity is quarantining him off the network. So he comes back into the office, plugs his laptop in. We won't allow him onto the network until his machine has downloaded definitions from the internet. So using the firewall component, we'll say, OK, all network traffic except for the live update service, which is where our definitions and, and updates get pulled from, will be disabled. So you can download the updates, and once they're in place, we'll remove the quarantine and allow you back onto the network. So that's a, a really effective way of ensuring that machines are up to date and compliant, and at the same time that the, the rest of the organization isn't subjected to the risk that that one machine uh, is introduced. We then have system lockdown, so looking at application control. So being able to do that whitelisting and blacklisting of applications on the endpoint to ensure that essentially the machines that are on the system are uh, secured. So we can use this as a response rule. So if for all of a sudden we find a bit of malware on a machine, we can instigate system lockdown. That will essentially restrict the, the list of software that can run on that machine to only critical systems or, or systems that are required by IT for the cleanup process. Uh, and that will essentially mean that the malware then can't infect uh, file shares or it can't suddenly jump into your uh, other applications, so CRM systems, for example, and start exfiltrating that data. So it can really restrict what starts running in the event of a, of a malicious outbreak. The next point talks to the secure web gateway integration. So this is to use the Blue Coat Proxy SG uh, as the secure web gateway in an integration with that. So really what we can do now is we can start talking between the two. So since the Blue Coat acquisition uh, at the start of August, uh, just trying to remember when that was, uh, we've already done a number of close-knit integrations between products. So if, for example, we see a bit of malware at the endpoint, we will automatically talk back to the, the web gateway, say, we've seen this come through, this is what file it was, add that to your blacklist. So the two will talk between each other to establish what files should and shouldn't be trusted. So if one sees a bit of malware that the other one hasn't, the two will interoperate and they'll communicate with each other to ensure that actually that bit of malware is known by both. So that in future, when that comes through, we know that we can block it at the gateway rather than letting it through to an endpoint. Uh, and that was always the story that uh, a lot of vendors uh, have missed out on. Uh, and this is where, because Symantec, we have the full portfolio, we actually have that operation uh, and sort of interoperability between products that allows us to do that kind of integration. Uh, and then the last point is our, is our EDR capability, so our endpoint detection and response capability. And that comes through uh, an additional piece of the puzzle called Advanced Threat Protection Endpoint, or EDR Console, as it's more commonly known. Uh, and essentially what that's going to allow us to do is orchestrate responses. So if we come through to here, we've already talked about that bit. Okay, finally I don't have a slide bit. But essentially what we're going to be able to do with the EDR capability is once we run a file on an endpoint, if it clears the traditional detection stack but looks slightly suspicious, we'll offload it to our ATP capability. What that will then do is run it in a sandbox, and that will run it in a sandbox that allows us to work out whether or not that's malicious. So we'll monitor the full behavior, and we do what we call user emulation during that process. So we can establish uh, what does it do when a user opens and closes it three times, what happens in 10 minutes' time? Because a lot of the malware writers, they've got, they've got quite smart and they've got savvy to the idea of traditional sandboxing. Uh, and they'll write things like time gates in there so that things don't uh, effectively detonate until 10 minutes after they've been first run. Uh, or they don't uh, operate until somebody's closed the window or until somebody's done something with the file. So we do user emulation. We can sort of effectively reenact the sort of traditional things that a user would do that would then trigger that malware. 
Uh, and if at that point we discover there is something wrong with it, then we can discover uh, and we can orchestrate a response for it. So once we've discovered it, we can tell the endpoint protection agent your machine is now potentially infected. You haven't seen it with the traditional stack, but let's get it cleaned up. So what we'll then do is automate a quarantine. So we'll pull that machine off of the network using the firewall. The only thing that we can then talk to it is the endpoint protection console. What we can then say is, okay, we found this file. We know what it looks like. Let's uh, essentially turn it off. Let's, let's remediate. Let's clear it off. Um, and then using that, we can then remediate the machine and then remove the quarantine. So bring the machine back onto the network all automatically. So we can orchestrate that whole end-to-end -end process for remediation to ensure that the endpoint is, is completely clean. So that's where the EDR capability fits in as well. So coming back and just to summarize uh, before we open up for questions, we're really looking at this next-gen protection technology and enhancements thing for, for SEP14. So machine learning, we've talked about, but it really comes down to pre-execution detection. The application protection side of things through memory exploit mitigation, being able to look at vulnerable apps, so that there are certain vulnerable apps that we, we know everybody uses, uh, and they're the ones that we've gone for protecting first. We have the emulation to look for anti-evasion techniques, so being able to unpack malware from within an executable. We have the intelligent threat cloud, so being able to do that really sort of large drop in definition sizes. We have the performance enhancements for, for faster real-time detection, so that all comes through being able to use machine learning and, and memory exploit mitigation much more. We have the integrations, so we've already talked about the, the integration to the SG, the proxy SG, uh, as well as to our EDR side of things, and that's where our enhanced automation comes in. So being able to do automatic remediation uh, and response. So finishing up, uh, and there are a number of reports that I'm sure the guys at Bytes can share with you, but Symantec is uh, consistently outperforming uh, other products in the class. We are outperforming from a detection point of view and from a false positive point of view. People like Silence, uh, as well as all the traditional vendors that we'll have seen in the, in the market. Uh, and we've got, uh, and this just really speaks to the, the amount of data that we can collect, as well as the number of customers that are utilizing the products, over 270,000 semantic endpoint protection customers. And what that leads to is that 175 million endpoints that are secured by SEP. Uh, and SEP 14 w was really the biggest release we've done for SEP since about 2011. It really comes in uh, and delivers all this great technology. Um, and that's why we had over 300 customers interested in the beta for it uh, and really wanted to get involved with, with Symantec Endpoint Protection 14 uh, ahead of time. So just to summarize from the next steps point of view, and I, I know Amy alluded to this at the top of the call, about getting a call back uh, and being able to do live product demonstrations, uh, there's something we can definitely cater for. So if you want to fill in the, the form or, or put something in the Q&A section or the chat, uh, we can definitely arrange for that to happen. And at this point, I, I'd like to say thank you. And uh, if we could open it up for, for any questions, that'd be fantastic. Thanks, Jake. Thank you. Um, so we've had a couple of questions uh, already come in that uh, we've run through now. Um, as mentioned earlier, if, if you have got any further questions, there is uh, a little panel on the right-hand side questions, and if you had that. So... Um, <clears throat> So, Jake, a couple of questions. Um, is it easy to set up whitelisting of applications across groups of PCs? So it is, yeah. Um, it depends on, on what applications and how many applications are whitelisting. But essentially, there is a, a little tool that will help us find the hash for those, uh, and we can use that to, to automatically add that into the product. So it is fairly straightforward, um, and again, it might be worth delving into that in more depth if we do a, a live demonstration of how the console looks, uh, and we can go into more depth about how that's actually done, but it is a fairly straightforward process. Okay, thanks. Um, and then a question here around uh, upgrading from 12.1.2. Um, um, around the desktops to Windows 10 to ensure capability. Um, and they're asking that what aspects, if they didn't up get, upgrade to the ATP purchase, would they not get um, from just using the SEP console? So if, if you move to SEP 14 rather than ATP, 
you would get everything that we spoke about except for that EDR piece at the end. So the EDR is essentially what ATP delivers, uh, but you would get the full protection stack with SEP14 itself. Uh, the only bit that you don't get is that uh, endpoint detection response sandboxing capability that we talked about towards the end there. That's the only bit that comes with ATP. Okay, cool. Um, a couple more. Uh, what is the true differentiator of SEP14 um, compared to SEP12? So really it's the, the introduction of exploit mitigation uh, as well as the introduction of the machine learning piece. So they weren't available in SEP12. Uh, SEP12 brought a lot of the stack. So it brought uh, a lot of the reputation and behavioral pieces, but it didn't bring through the emulation, the, the memory exploit mitigation, uh, and the advanced machine learning. Uh, and what that kind of meant was that you didn't have the same level of uh, detection capability, and you also have the, the larger definition sizes. So because you haven't got the, the enhancements of using the more signature-less technologies, which we'll define as being machine learning uh, and the memory exploit mitigation, the definition size was larger. So they're, they're, they're the two key takeaways. There's, there's additional detection technologies in SEP14 above and beyond SEP12, um, and we've got the, the improved performance in that the definition sizes are smaller due to more of the technology being signature-less. Great, thanks. Um, uh, couple more coming in. Uh, is SEP12 and or SEP14 client compatible with Windows XP Pro? So SEP14 definitely isn't. Um, I can look into whether SEP12 still is. Um, yeah. but we'll have to take that one offline because I can't recall the, the support list off the top of my head, I'm afraid. Yeah, that's fine. We're, uh, we'll come back to you, uh, David, with uh, details and compatibility list. Okay, uh, does real-time cloud lookup require internet connection by the client computer? It does, yeah. So, again, it's a, an optional piece about whether or not you want to have that turned on. Um, it does allow for the, the smaller definition files, but it does mean that you need to have that internet connection at the time of being able to look for it. The, the main point, I suppose, to raise around that is that advanced machine learning um, and a lot of the other detection capabilities will still exist without that, that real-time cloud lookup. Um, but what it will mean is that definition sizes are slightly larger. Uh, so for environments where uh, potentially there's a server farm that doesn't have internet connection, we, we would look to turn that piece off and ensure that the rest of the stack uh, is on there still. Uh, but that's, yeah, the, the one requirement for that is that there is an internet connection. Okay. Okay, cool. Um, we have an operation writing audio files to USB stick. These sticks are first reformatted on independent machines. And is it possible to allow these sticks and other specified sticks for IT use? Does this affect Windows 10 recovery drives? So, talk to the USB point, it's definitely possible to use those sticks. So, using the, the USB lockdown capability, essentially we, we can either do it as a blanket, we'll block all USB, or we can be specific and say we'll block all USB except for this whitelist of known uh, serial numbers or UIDs that we have, because uh, the UID shouldn't change at reformatting, um, so we can still use that, that list for, this is the list of sticks that we want to keep uh, using. Talking to the, the Windows 10 recovery piece there, I'd need to come back to you on that one. So if we can take that question away, Matt, that would be helpful. Yep, absolutely. And yep, we'll come back to you on that one, Tony. Um, okay, so that, that concludes the, the, the questions. Um, if you do have any more, um, use that tell me more at bytes.co.uk. Um, obviously, we've got access to Jake, but there's lots of other pre-sales consultants that can run through further deep dives or demonstrations of the console to uh, illustrate the, the new product and we can also do sort of free high level license assessments to make sure that you are uh, have the ability to to upgrade to set full team free of charge so so please get in touch and we're more than happy to assist you through that journey and um, Jake thank you again for your for your support and uh, thanks everyone for uh, attending today's webinar I hope you found it useful uh, and look forward to speaking to you in the near future
Thanks. Thank you very much, everybody.